Again, I'm Barb Van Hoy with the Community Development Division of the City of Colorado Springs. Uh, welcome to Rental Rights 101. This is our fourth workshop in a series this year. Um, these events are produced. We can only do them with great community partners. Um, we really all work together to put these together. Thanks to Colorado Legal Services, the Pikes Peak Library District, the Justice Center, and Colorado Housing Connects. Uh, this afternoon, we will hear from each of them about legal and housing resources available um, in our community. And we're also going to hear from uh, about a new um, eviction diversion mediation program that we're really excited is getting started. Um, then we'll hear a very in-depth um, presentation by um, Colorado Legal Services Attorney Clinton Albert, uh, who will really dive into understanding your lease and issues around rental leases, how to prevent uh, conflict, how to deal with it if it comes about, what you need to know. So the City of Colorado Springs Community Development Division, just to let you know, uh, we manage the city's annual funding from HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So our division uses those funds to increase the supply of affordable housing in Colorado Springs to improve neighborhood facilities like community centers and bus stops, making them accessible. We provide services for low and moderate income uh, residents and we promote, so this is how we use the funding. So we don't do this. We work with great community partners like Silver Key, who I know someone here is in the room. Uh, we fund neighborhood economic development by supporting small businesses and we support reduction uh, in response to homelessness. These workshops are really important part of our goal to also um, further um, fair housing, which we are responsible to do also as administrators of HUD funds. And so these workshops help to do that. We want to reduce conflict between tenants and landlords, uh, prevent unjust evictions, and to keep more people in our community housed. So as I mentioned, this is part of a series of workshops. We have one more this year. Our website right now says it's on November 15th, but we are moving it to is it the 14th or the 16th? The 16th, November 16th. So um, you can uh, get reminded of that if you sign up for the Community Development Division's newsletter. Um, and, uh, and also if you already registered for this through the Zoom registration, you will get um, information about that as well. There's a physical sign-up sheet in the back of the room to get on that as well. And I do want you to know we're gonna send out to uh, everyone who signs up uh, the slides and a recording of this um, as well. Uh, and, and then we'll let you know about when the next one is coming. Okay. Um, what else? Okay, so now we're ready to, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, our uh, partners to talk about some of the great resources that are available in the community. Um, the Community Development Division, I'll just mention quickly, we um, share information about these workshops. We also have an emergency housing resources page where you can get connected to these resources and many others um, for help with housing. And um, I'm gonna introduce Deb Hamilton, who is the law librarian here with Pikes Peak Library District to talk about the legal resources. Hi everyone, my name is Deb Hamilton. Um, let me just get out of this really quick if I can. I'm the law librarian here for Pikes Peak Library District. So our library system, we have a um, public law library that's located at the downtown location, the Penrose Library. Um, we also have a number of online resources that I'm going to very quickly kind of show you how to locate. But I have some information on the back table about both of those, um, as well as a free legal clinic that we do once a month down at our Fountain Library location. Um, but to find the stuff that we have online, if you're at the library's website, you just go ahead here, click on research, open up law collection. 
Um, and then you'll find a variety of resources listed on this page, such as upcoming legal programs, um, where you can find more information about the next renter's rights presentation, as well as other things we do at the library. Um, if you scroll down, though, I want to show you a couple things here, too. Um, Laura, who's going to be talking about the Justice Center, there's information about their clinic program and their Ask a Lawyer service. Um, you also will get information about the eviction uh, diversion mediation program. That handout is here as well. Um, and then um, if you need Colorado Legal Services, we have their information linked right here, too. Um, and... Um, as well as the Colorado Revised Statutes, which is where you'll find a lot of the landlord tenant laws. Um, so it's just kind of on that first page, you'll find a lot of the information that we're gonna talk about today. So if you forget where to go, you can always just come to the library's website, go to research, click on law and just scroll down. Um, if you forget though, you can always get in touch with me. So my information's right here, or you can just call the library's main number, just ask to be connected to the law librarian and they'll patch you through to my phone. So I'm not gonna take up any more time. I just wanted to show you those things real quick and thank you for being here. And we'll get over to the next presenter, which I think is gonna be Laura. So um, let me try and get your site up, Laura, for you. Everything's popping open. I hate how they hide it all underneath here. Ugh. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm Laura McKernan. I am the new executive director at the Justice Center, and I feel very blessed to be here with you guys today letting you know about the Justice Center and what we can do to help you and serve you. So we have three ways that we serve our community. The first one is we actually have you submit an application in case you need to have a case presented before a judge or a mediator, which we'll hear about in a second about this new programs we have. And we will do our very, very best to get an attorney in our community to take your case either for free, pro bono, or for a reduced cost, so low bono. The second thing we can do for you is we can set up clinics. We have one that's over the phone every Wednesday, which you can call into. And you can see a little bit about that on our website on Call a Lawyer. The second thing we can do for you, and it opens, there you go. Second thing we can do for you is if you have some kind of disability and you can't actually grab a phone or stay on the line for quite a, a while, because sometimes they'll take a bit, you can actually write in to us and we will have one of our lawyers in the community answer your question within seven business days. And usually they'll take less time. That's what we've seen is the trend is they'll take less time. But we say seven business days so that you know the time frame we're working with. The third thing we can do is you can come to one of our in-person clinics and you can meet an attorney in person. You can bring all your documents, which is always a plus, I feel, and you can talk to him or her about your issue and you can tell him what's going on and what an actual attorney would do in that case. So the next time we are doing one of these events is September 17th for our senior community and it'll be at the senior center. You can learn about that on our website where it says Senior Law Day. So you can learn about how you can get some information in that way. And then the other thing we have is educational tools. And very specifically for people going through landlord and tenant issues, we have a few videos. We have a booklet, which we call a toolkit about eviction prevention. And you can also hear other customers that we've had, other clients we've had, discuss what it is that they've gone through and how they can really uh, help you out with their own experience. So you can see those videos online. And very new to the Justice Center is that you can also see it in Spanish now. And this is not just a widget translating, this is an actual human who's translated it. So if Spanish is your first language, go ahead and click where it says Español. And our website is now in Spanish, which is awesome. <laughs> so thank you for having me here and thank you for listening. Yes. Can't see the whole website up there. What is the website? Justice Center COS.org. Got it. Thank you. Let me see if I can help you guys by doing that. Oh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> no worries. Yes. 
Does this also apply to uh, running on a, a property? All of that information? Some of it, yes, yeah, some of it will be relevant to you. So there's a few forms that you can see about habitability, for instance, which sometimes we see as an issue in that area. Um, and you can also see our videos about what can happen in those situations. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you for having me. I'll get back to Barb. Thank you, Laura. And next, um, Brent, we have um, an attorney in private practice who uh, helps mediation through the ju state judiciary, um, their Office of Dispute Resolution, who's working on a new evic eviction diversion program. So Brent, please come tell us about that. Just leave that up. Okay. Okay, um, so I don't have a, a video, so I'm already behind the curve here, but um, um, I'm Brent and I'm an attorney and also a mediator in this community. I've been uh, practicing law about 25 years and I've been mediating about 10 years. And um, I mediate for a, an office called the Office of Dispute Resolution. And basically that's our statewide office that arranges to have mediation for court cases and other types of cases. And um, I was asked to help put together a program that specifically addresses um, uh, disputes between landlords and tenants um, that involve one of three things, um, either non-payment of rent, so if you have a dispute with your landlord about back rent, um, uh, lease agreement violations. Um, if the uh, tent landlord is alleging that the tenant has violated a provision in the lease or vice versa, if the uh, tenant thinks the landlord is violating a provision in the lease. And then we also deal with um, security deposits. And so what mediation is in a nutshell is it's a trained neutral person like myself who would sit down with the uh, tenant and sit down with the landlord and talk about the issue and try to come up with an agreement that works for both parties. And if that agreement can be uh, reached, then we would put it in writing and we have the parties sign that agreement. Um, <clears throat> uh, mediation is done uh, remotely. So you'd either appear over the phone or over like uh, video conferencing and this program is free um, as well. And so as long as the landlord and tenant agree to uh, attend this program, then um, you all can generally get in, get in with the mediator within a week of reaching out to our program. Um, and we can get it set up. It's very convenient. Like I said, it's free, it's quick. Um, generally, it's a very uh, a less stressful process than uh, going to court. Um, and typically, parties are more satisfied with the outcome if they go through mediation instead of going through the lo longer legal process. Um, let's see, what am I leaving out here? Um, you, the um, parties can participate in this program if there's already been an eviction case filed. Um, in fact, you can ask the judge to order mediation and our judge may very well do that because she refers those cases. Um, but the real um, goal of this program is to try to get people into mediation before it gets to court. So if you have some sort of dispute with your landlord, um, and I'll get to you in one second here. If you have some sort of dispute with your landlord, um, and uh, you want to um, try to get the issue resolved before it gets to court, you just ask your landlord if they'll at attend this program. If they say yes, you reach out to us and we can get you into mediation quickly. The whole process is confidential as well. So nobody hears about what's discussed in mediation, um, but the signed agreement is a binding agreement if, if you end up reaching an agreement. 
Okay, so that's how the program works and I have flyers um, at the back of the room. I've seen uh, some hands come up, so. Flyers, great, okay. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, you can take questions. Yeah, you answered it. I was uh, gonna ask if it's private or it's public knowledge. Yeah, there's very strict laws in Colorado about mediation and confidentiality. Um, basically, with a very few exceptions, like if people are going to tell you they're going to commit a crime or something like that. Um, but generally, what's said in mediation stays in mediation. It's all confidential. Um, I have two questions, Dr. So, what is the language? So, this is a voluntary program. Okay. So both parties have to agree to attend. Um, our, um, my other question is about the results. So um, Colorado Springs is 67% um, plus of the population. And uh, many of the people in that demographic uh, either don't have access or don't have the ability to do a lot. So we make some sort of um, uh, play for them to stay in there so they can improve. Um, <laughs> so uh, we don't have a physical space to mediate these cases be because the office that this is uh, run through does all remote mediations in El Paso County. However, parties can attend by phone. Um, and I know that's a challenge sometimes as well. Um, and um, But at, at the moment, we don't have an in-person option. Sure. Does mediation stop or pause the eviction process? It does not. What if it's not a eviction and they uh, just decide that uh, they don't want to remove the lease? Well, we don't handle those particular issues. Um, like I said, we, we handle uh, back rent or lease violations, basically, but not renewal issues. So we wouldn't mediate that issue through this program. This program is very limited to those issues I just identified. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you say a lease agreement. What if you, you have, like I had a lease five years ago, we had the hail storms. Um, okay. And so my lease did not get renewed after the hail storm because there were still items needed to be repaired that the hail storm damaged. So I was month to month. And then um, I got a notice on the 14th of June, July, excuse me, that my rent was going to increase by $200, effective the 1st of August. And my security deposit, which I had put up two months security deposit, needed to also meet the new rent amount. So that meant I needed to pay $400 in security deposit and an extra $210 a month. But, and I could be wrong. I thought I read on the statute that if I didn't have a lease, that I needed a 60 day notice for that increase. Um, but the one of the secretaries told me, the broker told her, since I had signed the lease in the past, so I had signed the written agreement, even though it was expired, that I only need a 30 day notice. So okay. I don't have a problem paying the additional rent, but I didn't think my security deposit. Okay. In case if I got a pay, I don't have a problem doing that either. I'm uh, just trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong. Let, let me ask you, um, are you in the process of an eviction or no, it, that I, has that has not happened yet? No. no. Okay, so if, I paid my rent. I understand. The, 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 um, yeah. The okay. That I've been on since it hadn't even been 30 days. I, I wasn't I, even given a 30 day notice. Okay. Yeah. So I understand. So yes, I think as long as you're, uh, the landlord wanted to come to mediation and try to figure out a solution, then this program would work for your situation. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, folks. <laughs> yeah. That's what I mean. Thank you, Brent. Um, oh, there's a question from online. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? 
can see the spots. Uh, the Hi. online question. Are you able to hear me? Able to hear me. How do I? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I don't know if you. I don't know if you. Okay. Are we good? Great. Yes, okay. absolutely. Right. Thank you. All right. So one of the other resources, um, the who we normally have someone to speak about, uh, is Colorado Housing Connects, and that is a HUD approved housing housing counseling. Uh, resource in the state of Colorado. And I'm going to pull that website up really quickly. Uh, and this is also a great source for questions. When you're not quite sure who can help you with the question, they are a great resource to help connect folks who have housing related issues. So Colorado Housing Connects can help uh, provide or connect you with connect renters with, oh, actually that's not what I meant to click, um, renters with all uh, sets of issues, also issues for home buyers. Oh, that's not showing up there. Um, and homeowners, resources and information for landlords, all kinds of help uh, around housing. Yes. That is a serious problem that unfortunately a lot of people are facing. Clinton will have some uh, response to that. Uh, and I actually just attended a statewide housing meeting today where people were talking about what are there's a huge need for new ways to address the fast increases in rents that people cannot manage. I don't think that there's a simple answer for that right now, but um, but I did want to um, introduce Clinton, who is our main speaker today. Um, Clinton Albert is a housing attorney with Colorado Legal Services. Uh, he served there for four years, and his caseload is made up solely of landlord-tenant uh, matters, covers a broad range of legal issues. And so today's presentation will focus especially on all the issues, things that you need to know around your lease. So please join me in welcoming Clinton Albert. You can take this out if you need to. I don't think you can it up. That's okay. But you do want to make sure that I can tell this so that I can see you. Yeah, and keep this. Oh, yep. No. How did we do this before? Um, let's click on this one. Which one? This one? This one? Nope, that was not it. So we figured this out a minute ago. Oh, yeah, display settings. Okay. Exit. Exit. That should be right there. Duplicate sledge. Oh, that's the slides. Oh, that's it. There we go. Okay. So now we have that for both. There we go. All right. And here. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming out this evening. My name is Clinton Albert. I am a housing attorney with Colorado Legal Services. Uh, to answer your question about the systemic issues, don't have one for you. Um, rent control is prohibited by law in Colorado, which would be a um, seemingly a simple solution, uh, but currently there is not anything to limit the amount of a rent increase. Your rent can, rent can only be increased once in a 12-month period of occupancy, whether or not there is a written lease or no written lease, and it can only be increased on 60 days notice. Um, no, I remembered, I remembered. Uh, so it can only be increased on 60 days notice and a notice to quit cannot be served to kind of bypass that 60 day period, all right? 
Um, so uh, as indicated, tonight's focus is going to be on understanding your lease, what to look out for, uh, certain lease provisions that are prohibited by law, some that are required to be included, and uh, just some general issues between with uh, kind of your standard private leases with private landlord tenant arrangements. And it will also touch a little bit on uh, leases in mobile home for owners in mobile home parks. If I start speaking too fast or too quickly, just yell at me. It's something I do. So um, please do not feel hesitant to just pipe up and let me know you're speaking too quickly. And if you can't hear me, also, same thing. Just yell at me. All right. So keep in mind as we go through this, uh, this presentation is for informational purposes only. So when we get to the Q&A section, if you start your question with, well, my lease says X, so what do I do about Y? My answer is going to be apply for services with CLS because I can't provide legal, and legal advice this evening. Uh, also, keep in mind that when you ask those questions, I would likely have about five to 20 follow-up questions because housing issues require that thoughtful analysis of both the facts and the law that apply to your case. Uh, if you are a low income or a senior citizen, uh, I do have some material for uh, at least some brochures for CLS. I apologize. I did not bring the applications with me. Uh, you can apply online at coloradolegalservices.org, over the phone at extension 444, uh, or in person at 617 South Nevada Avenue during our business. 617 South Nevada Avenue. If you dial 719-471-0380. If you've registered, I believe the slides will be sent out. Yes. Okay. And also, even though Clinton cannot give you legal advice about your specific situation, any of the resources that we just mentioned can help you get more detailed help. All right, so while this is going to be understanding your lease, I've geared this more towards the written leases, um, but wanted to touch at least on verbal tendencies or oral leases. Uh, they are valid agreements. They can be upheld. Uh, they are more difficult to prove if a conflict ever arises in the lease or in the tenancy, I should say. Uh, but keep in mind that even if you don't have a written lease, uh, you still cannot waive your warranty of habitability protections, uh, the return of any security deposit, right to a demand for payment or compliance, a notice to quit, or the court process for FEDs. Uh, if possible, try to get any verbal agreement reduced down to writing, all right? I think that's the best practice for both, uh, the, both tenants and for landlords as well, because it sets a clear expectation of what's to be expected in this business relationship, because no matter how you may have known your landlord prior to moving in, or landlords, no matter how you may have known the tenant prior, whether it's friends, family, you know, social organization, church, whatever it may be, this is at the end of the day, a business relationship that we are dealing with and talking about. So let's start with the application process. Uh, I'll keep one thing to one thing in Colorado law that's been a recent addition over the last few years is the, uh, is the addition of income discrimination into unfair housing practices. So it is unfair, it is an unfair housing practice to discriminate against a person based on source of income there, with certain exceptions, uh, but source of income. So what does that mean? Uh, that means any lawful and verifiable source of money paid directly, indirectly, or on behalf of a person, including anything from, in, from uh, employment, occupation, or income or rental payments derived from a government or private assistance grant or loan program. Essentially, if you are, if you find yourself utilizing a housing choice voucher or some other kind of emergency housing voucher, that cannot be used as a reason to deny you a residence. <laughs> now, I hear the chuckles in the background because uh, in my experience, I've spoken to folks that have told me, well, this landlord told me they're not going to rent to me because I use a voucher. Well, you should apply anyway. And that's what we'll get to here in the Rental Application Fairness Act. Uh, so what this lays out is it lays out some do's and don'ts um, for what to expect when you're applying for a residence. First of all, landlords are not able to charge an application fee unless that fee is used to cover the entire amount uh, in processing the application. 
These costs may be taken from the actual expenses, or if we're thinking about a large scale apartment complex with multiple units and multiple applicants, the average cost to send off a batch of those applications. So can't charge different amounts to different applicants. Um, and then as a landlord and as a tenant, if you're applying for a residence, you have a right to a receipt or an anticipated disclosure statement stating, hey, this is what this is going to cost. Uh, so if you are applying for one and you are required to pay an application fee, you do have a right to have this disclosure statement outlining what the application costs are. And then landlords, if you give an estimate and then you have some amount back, you do have to make some good faith efforts to return that remainder to the applicant. So if you are applying, make sure that you provide a proper ma a good mailing ad address where you'd be able to receive mail in the event that there is some kind of refund coming your way from the application. And I didn't include this in the slides, but the reason I indicated that you should apply anyway, if you're told verbally that, oh, we're not accepting, we're not accepting vouchers is because if you are denied an applic if your application is denied, the prospective landlord must send you the, a written statement indicating why your application was denied. So even if that's, I, I recognize that that may be a bit financially burdensome. Um, however, if that, if the reasoning for the denial falls outside of the parameters of what is a reason to deny someone, um, then there may be an issue there to take further action. So receipts for payments, uh, this is going to be, uh, this is gonna pop up in a few areas throughout this presentation. But um, if you pay a an application fee with cash or money order, you should be able to receive a receipt for that payment on the spot. If you mail it in, uh, then you must make a request for a receipt and that receipt should be mailed to you within seven days. Uh, unless there's already a system in place uh, to document these payments, a portal system, some kind of electronic messaging system to say, hey, these are the payments that we've received and this is how it's been applied to your account. So what can be used as a basis to deny a residence? Uh, for rental or credit history, uh, landlords are only permitted to take the last seven years of rental or credit history into account when processing an application. So if you see some, if you get a denial that says, well, in, 20, in 2011, you filed for bankruptcy and that's going to be why we deny your application, that's outside of, that's outside of that seven-year period. So that's not a basis to deny someone's application. What about criminal history? Now, this is a, uh, I've gotten questions before of, well, I, you know, I, I made a mistake when I was younger. Um, I and I have this, all, this conviction on my record, can they use this against me? Uh, the answer is it depends, but probably not, depending on what we're talking about. For an arrest record, that can never be taken into consideration. You could be arrested 80 times. If you've never been convicted, that's 80 reasons that they can't use to deny an application. Criminal convictions cannot be used as a basis that are older than five years, uh, the exceptions to that are generally speaking methamphetamine related offenses, uh, I think with the exception of um, simple possession of methamphetamine, uh, but also offenses that require a person to register as a sex offender uh, pursuant to Colorado revised statute. And since this is cutting off at the bottom, let me try to drag this up top. Homicide related offenses and stalking. Those are the convictions that there is no time limit. Those can be continued to be used against you to deny an application for a residence. Even if it's a felony? Uh, if you have a felony auto theft from 10 years ago, that can't be used against you. But it's, yeah. Did you say these are just for the state of Colorado? Or Correct. I am only licensed to practice law in the state of Colorado. I am only... I am only knowledgeable about the laws in the state of Colorado, so I will only be speaking in reference to those. Other states are going to have different rules. So um, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, they're all going to have different rules. I don't know any of them. I'm not the person to ask about them. 
So what, hap what happens if your application is denied? Uh, like, I, like I indicated a little bit ago, uh, landlords are required to provide you with that written notice detailing why your application was denied. And it has to make, has to state the reasons. And you have a right to that to be returned within 20 calendar days. So again, that's why it's very critical to include good contact information that's going to stay available to you throughout that period of time. So what happens if the law is not followed in this respect? Uh, as an applicant, if you've been wrongfully denied, uh, you first have to send a demand letter stating that you've denied my application, you've denied my application for reasons that are not permitted by law. And if the, if the prospective landlord does not remedy the situation, does not correct the issue, then as an applicant, you can take them to court to seek three times the amount of the application fee, uh, court costs. Uh, also, you can seek reasonable attorney fees. So like I said, that, that demand letter, you have to first give the, the, the prospective landlord uh, a seven-day letter indicating your intention to file legal action. That gives the prospective landlord an opportunity to fix the mistake. Now, if an applicant just, and if an applicant gets denied, is upset about it, but it's valid reasons for a denial, and they still bring a lawsuit anyway, uh, then they will be liable for the landlord's court costs and potential and attorney fees in that situation. And then there are the statutes that correspond with the Rental Application Fairness Act. So if your application is approved, see if I can. If your application is approved, the next step in the process is going to be to sign the lease itself. Before you sign it, do not flip to the back page. Do not just go to every tab that says initial here. Read each and every line, each and every page. I don't care if it's two pages or 45 or 90. You need to read it because when you sign it, you're agreeing to the entirety of its contents. So it is not a defense down the line if there becomes a dispute to say, well, I, I didn't read that far into my lease. But when you sign it, you're agreeing to it. So if you read it or you didn't read it, you agreed to it, and that's going to be a problem. And again, this is a contract. This is a business relationship. It is a good business practice to read what you are signing. This is a legally binding document. So things to keep in mind when you're – so as you're reviewing the lease, what are you looking out for? Well, Verbal agreements will not overrule a written agreement. So if you're signing the lease and you think you have a verbal agreement that, oh, I'm going to be allowed to have, you know, my, my cousin's going to be able to live with me. I'm, my roommate's going to be able to live with me. I'm going to be able to have this pet, but it's not included in the lease, but there's a verbal agreement. There's a handshake agreement, something to that effect. Put it in writing because the verbal agreement is not worth the paper that it's written on in this situation. Um, it also, and this comes up a bit, uh, if when we're talking about, when I've spoken to folks with a fixed income, um, not as much anymore with the change to the late fees, which we'll touch on a little bit later, but if you get paid on the third of the month and your lease says that your rent is due on the first of the month, your rent is due on the first of the month. Even if your landlord knows this is when I get paid because that's what the lease says, that's what you've agreed to. So if you see that, Try to make some, try to make an agreement or try to have some edits made to the lease to reflect that the rent is due on the third of the month. I don't know how to stop the person who is writing on the screen. Um, I don't know how to take that off, I'm sorry. So another reason that you wanna read through the entirety of the document is some of them, some of these leases they may be a boilerplate lease that was kind of cut and pasted, and it will refer to C addendum A, addendum B, whatever it may be. And as you're flipping through, you don't see that addendum. We'll request a copy of it because you're agreeing to what's in that addendum as well. And if it's if it's indicated to you that, well, that's just, you know, we don't have that addendum, then request that it be stricken out. Request that that part of the lease be struck from, be struck 
And you both initial it showing that, hey, we both agreed to this edit, this alteration. Uh, because again, down the line, you don't want it, it, it. It's a little different if you've never been given these addendums or these additional documents, but you still want to know what it is that you're agreeing to because you want to head into your tenancy with a full knowledge of what is expected of you as a tenant. You have a right to a copy of your lease. You should absolutely be requesting a copy of your lease. Um, and if you do not receive one, it's probably not a good sign. Um, but with if you have a smartphone at a minimum or a camera at a minimum, try to take some pictures of every page. Uh, that way you at least have some kind of backup copy for your records. Huh? I said, I'm sorry you had to tell us that. <laughs> but some folks get caught up in it where, you know, they've, it, you know, as indicated in, as indicated a little bit ago, the market out there is very difficult for tenants. It's a fast moving market. And some folks are just so relieved to uh, avoid homelessness or remove themselves from homelessness that they don't think that far ahead. It's just, I, I've got a roof over my head. That is the today problem. I am solving the today problem. So I'm all for solving the today problem, but also to try to prevent tomorrow's problems as well. And requesting a lease, requesting a copy of your lease is a great step towards that. Also, the right to a copy of your lease is a fairly new law. That is a fairly new, I think that was added maybe three and a half years ago or so. So oddly enough, the right to a copy of your lease is a recent addition to landlord-tenant law here in Colorado. So what are some of the fundamentals that you're looking at in your lease? What's the lease term? No. Do you, is it going to be month to month? Is it a year long lease? Is it a two year lease? Is it a week long lease? Make sure that whatever conversations you had leading up to this, to signing this document, they're reflected in there. Because if you think you're signing a 12 month lease and you sign a month to month lease, well, you're a month to month tenant. Because again, that verbal agreement doesn't override what you signed. Authorized occupants, who's allowed to live in the residence? This is one where, again, um, any, if, there's, if someone's not initially listed on the lease, then, and they're over eight, I should specify that they are over 18 because if it's, if it's, an, if it's a minor child and a landlord denies that minor child, Unless there's, I don't know what reason it would be, but that could brush up against a fair housing violation. Yeah. If they have children in the community, so like let's say you're moving in and you have children, does that at least have to be stated though? Like it's me and my children. It depends on the size of the unit. Um, it, it, it depends because there are occupancy limits for from from a code enforcement perspective. Right. Um, but if I think I'm leasing to certain people and they take five or four of them has to be I would kind of like to know if they have to prove it because it would basically mean that I would deny them or not. Right. right. Um, you want to what I would recommend is uh, touch base with code enforcement to check on the occupancy limits for your unit just to see, you know, if there's a if you ever run into that situation, just to make sure that. Uh, you're not committing an unfair housing, that you're not discriminating based on familial status. All right. Um, I would agree that it's best practice to do that. Uh, and I'll just have to leave it at that for now. Okay. Um, rent and late fees. When is the rent due? Because again, like I indicated earlier, it doesn't matter what day you get paid on. Because if it's not reflected in your lease agreement, your rent is due on the due date regardless. Uh, late fees, what is the, what's the total, also for rent, what is the total amount of rent you're agreeing to? Are there any kind of other fees? Yes, hand in the back. So rent is due on the first, and mm -hmm. then you pay it on the first, but then the landlord changes the total amount of rent you pay at the end of the first, Well, this is why you want to have a copy of your lease. Um, if your rent due date is changed, 
um, then you may have to. All right, you're gonna have, I would recommend that you apply for services because we're getting a little too fact specific now. Yeah. Two questions sure. for you. Mm -hmm. The first one is when writing down a verbal agreement, does it need to be typed out? Is there a particular layout such as a place for both parties signature? Uh, it doesn't have to be typed out. You could write it on scratch paper if you wanted to. Um, if it's, it should be signed by both parties. Um, but sometimes you're going to have someone who refuses to sign an agreement. What I recommend doing in, that's, in that point is get an email address, type it all out in email, and send it to the person who's not agreeing to sign it and saying, hey, just wanted to, you know, this is just wanted to kind of summarize our conversation from earlier. Uh, here's my understanding of the agreement. If you have any, if I'm incorrect about any of this, if there are any clarifications, please let me know. That way you have some kind of uh, contemporaneous communication made that this was the agreement, this is what we did. So you're, you're just trying to protect yourself as much as possible. Okay. I got one more. Sure. Um, if two adults pool their resources to rent together, are landlords allowed to discriminate or deny an application on the basis of their relationship, i.e. friends, not married, where neither would qualify for the rental on their own? Uh, no, um, it may, again, we're kind of touching on familial status here a little bit. Um, however, if one of the applicants has, uh, poor credit, then landlords can use bad credit as a basis to deny an application. So it, it, it depends, um, is the ultimate answer to that question. Um, and folks, keep in mind that I will be opening this up to questions at the end of this. Um, and this is not going to be as lengthy as prior presentations since this is a more condensed and singularly focused presentation. So there should be plenty of time for us to get in our questions at the end. Uh, reason it's important to look for late fees is one, if you don't have late fees disclosed in your lease, they can't be charged against you, never. Because late fees must be disclosed in the lease itself Otherwise, no, that cannot happen. Also, what are the amounts of late fees? Because if it is greater than $50 or 5% of your rent, no, that is not something that can occur either. And we'll touch on that in a further slide about all of the no's that I like to point out on late fees. This is in a very important section, in my opinion, to pay attention to. This is the, the holdover or rollover section of the lease. What happens at the end of your initial lease term? Does it renew automatically? Does it renew if no one says anything? Does it renew for the same amount of time? Does it go from a year long lease to a month to month lease? Uh, those are going to be things that you want to see happen. In Colorado, uh, for most tenancies, uh, landlords are not obligated to renew a lease at the end of its lease term. So they do not have to renew a lease if they do not want to. Um, there are some tenancies that you have to have a reason to not renew a lease. But again, that's also part of why I can't provide legal advice tonight, because I'm going to need to look, I'm going to need to review leases, ask questions, uh, just kind of do some basic investigation. Also, notice information. And this is, yes? Yeah, we have so many uh, tracks mm -hmm. and we have to return it. Mm -hmm. When the owner we had signed a lease with him, and he has since passed away, that he sold the property to his daughter. This was several years back, and that we didn't know whether the lease is still in effect, or because we never signed a lease with her. And uh, so it's, it's still in effect, even though we... So the short answer is I don't know. Huh? The short answer is I don't know because I don't have your lease in front of me. All right, but we have the, the original lease, but we never signed one with his daughter. Oh, I, I understand. So with the original lease, um, and I'll get, we'll touch on this as well. What you're looking for in the original lease is something to the effect of a survivorship clause. Uh, 
meaning that the contract is binding upon all heirs, successors, assignees, or assignors in interest, meaning that the lease survives the signers. All right. Um, so without the lease, but generally speaking, it your original lease may no longer be in effect, but the fact that if you've been paying rent and it's been accepted for years, you've established a tenancy as well. You have not forfeited your rights as a tenant just by not signing a lease with the new owner. Oh, so going back, Electra, the notice information. This is important because if you run into an issue, this is gonna be more geared towards the warranty of habitability. Where do you send your notice if there is a problem? And if that information is not in the lease, ask it to be included. I think that that's best for both parties entering into this, both as a tenant who's dealing with an uninhabitable condition and as a landlord who's trying to protect their, their rental property. So make sure that that information's in there. It is required to be in there from the warranty of habitability, but there's not any kind of statutory penalty uh, for not including it. I just don't think it's good business to not include that because in this relation, in this landlord tenant relationship, both sides are going to want to have as clear communications as possible about the tenancy and about any issues going on in the property. So why is this notice so, why is an electronic notice so important? Because that's really what I'm referring to here. Uh, a work order is not an electronic notice for the purpose of warranty of habitability. It is not. So what makes up an electronic notice? It is noticed by email, portal, or management communication system that is available to both the landlord and the tenant. If you send an electronic notice, you must send it to only the email address, phone number, or electronic portal specified by the landlord in the rental agreement. So that's why it's very critical to keep tabs on what is in my lease. Where am I sending these notices if something goes awry? Uh, because if there's an email address listed in the lease agreement and you're texting your landlord, hey, I've got a broken window, my heat's, my heat's not working. Well, you've not followed the lease, so you've not actually provided provided the warranty of habitability notice. So you haven't triggered the, your landlord is not then in violation of the warranty of habitability because it was sent to uh, an address that was not specified in the lease agreement. All right, but some leases, they're not gonna have that information. All right, so you can review it. You can see that it's not there. You can ask for it to be included. And maybe you get, oh, I'll have to get that information for you later and I'll send it to you later, and it never happens. So what, what about this situation? And this is a little off topic from the lease, but I think it is important to acknowledge this point. Um, if your lease is silent on where you send an electronic notice, then at that point, you're able to communicate as a tenant, you're able to communicate with your landlord in a manner in which they communicate with you. So landlords, this is also why it's really important to include this, if you don't include this in the information and you send a text to your tenant or tenant, you receive a text from your landlord saying something like, happy birthday, happy Labor Day, happy 4th of July. You now have the address, you now have the phone number you can text for the warranty of habitability notice. All right, so best practice, include this in the lease, cut off any kind of miscommunications throughout the tenancy itself. So yeah, if your lease is silent, then practice will control. If you previously emailed, you would email electronic notice, texting, texting, so on and so forth. You must retain sufficient proof of delivery of the electronic notice. If it's an email, try to print the email and save it. If it's a text message, screenshot it, back it up. Losing it is going to be detrimental down the line because if you ever need to rely on that notice, you're gonna need to show that, hey, I sent this. So getting to the lease itself and what's required to be in the lease agreement. There are some basics, the term, the rent, the address. Also, you need to know what you're actually signing a contract for. It's also required that there be a statement indicating the name and address of the landlord or landlord's agent, all right? If at any point throughout the tenancy that changes, so if you own a home and you use a property management company and you decide to switch, the new property management company as a tenant, they have to notify you that they're the new agent. 
So if the landlord or the landlord's agent ever changes as a tenant, you have a right to know who the new person is. The email address, phone number, or electronic portal to send warranty of habitability notice or notices. So again, it's not included. Ask what that information is. It's a contract. You can take a blank piece of paper. You can write addendum on the top of it. You can sign it, and then you can staple it to the back of it, back of the lease as well. That's going to be binding because it's going to be a likely going to be binding because it's a writing signed by both parties. What are things that cannot be included in your lease? This list is a little bit more extensive. So these type of lease provisions, they are not enforceable. They are void against, they are against public policy. They are void and they are unenforceable. A waiver of the return of your security deposit. The security deposit is money that as a tenant, you have paid to guarantee performance of the contract. It remains the tenant's property until there is a deduction, until or unless there is a withholding from the security deposit for one of the lawful reasons to withhold a security deposit. You cannot waive uh, the warranty of habitability. The exception here is if there is a separate written agreement, so a second document executed, that is supported by consideration, money, rent reduction, something to that effect, and the tenant has the required skills, uh, they're an HVAC specialist, they are an electrician, they're a plumber, then at that point, you can enter into an agree a separate agreement from the lease itself, indicating that this portion, you know, tenant, uh, I am agreeing to take on this part of maintenance in the home, uh, and that's going to be my responsibility and not the landlord's. You cannot waive the court process, the court process for FEDs, FEDs, forcible entry and detainer. Uh, that's the Colorado terminology for an eviction case. You have a right to court. It's a process. You're going to be given notice of it. You're not going to come home and find the locks changed, the door boarded up. If you do, please contact us. That's potentially an unlawful eviction, and that's really uh, prohibited by law. You cannot waive your right to a demand for payment. So there are a few bases for uh, evict for grounds for an eviction. Uh, one of them is if somebody is uh, has violated a lease provision multiple times. Accept rent. You can be late on your rent every single month. You can be late every single month. You can pay it late every single month. That's expensive. Would advise against doing that. But every month you are late, you have a right to a demand for payment, indicating that you know, what the default is, what the rent that is owed is, and that you have 10 days to pay it back. After that 10-day process, you can still pay it back, uh, but your landlord then has the right to file an eviction case at that time. There cannot be an unreasonable liquidated damages for eviction notice or action. So if you're late on your rent, your landlord can't have any kind, can't say, well, you were 10 days late, so I'm now charging you three months in advance. Nope, that's not how that's going to work. Uh, again, if you find yourself in that situation, please take Colorado Legal Services information. Give us a call, drop off an application. There also cannot be a one-way fee-shifting clause for attorney fees. It has to be reciprocal, meaning that the prevailing party in a case is entitled to attorney fees. So if you're a tenant and your landlord tries to evict you and you successfully defend against that eviction, and then you get next month's statement saying, hey, you owe us attorney fees. No, you do not. Um, and any kind of lease clause that would indicate that would potentially violate the uh, law surrounding attorney fees and when they are available to folks in an eviction proceeding. Late fees charged in violation of the law. So there's a lot of rules regarding late fees um, and we'll, there's a slide to deal with that in a little bit, um, but there are very specific ways in which late fees uh, must be charged if they are to be charged at all. 
So other sections to review, pet sections. If you have an agreement or understanding that you will have a pet, then make sure that the lease reflects that agreement. A service animal is distinct from an emotional support animal, and a service animal is not a pet. That is a medical device. Um, it is the same as a nebulizer, an oxygen tank, an inhaler. I don't care. It is a it is a device. It is a tool. It is not for legal purposes. It's a tool. That's it. It's a medical device. You can't be denied an application because you have a service animal. For an emotional support animal, that's going to be a little bit different. Uh, for an emotional support animal, you would have, if that's going to be an issue, uh, generally speaking, you should be submitting what's called a reasonable accommodation request uh, to accommodate uh, your support animal. Maintenance sections. What? Oh, that's a typo, sorry. Um, yeah. Service animals, is there a limit to how many service animals an individual person can have? I am not that well versed in the Americans with Disabilities Act to answer that question off the top of my head. <laughs> Folks, we're gonna have I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna have questions at the end. All right. Um, so maintenance sections. Um, what are your responsibilities for upkeep around the premises? Now, I'm not talking about things like you've got to replace the doors, you've got to paint the house. Um, because I don't know why anybody would contract that into the lease agreement itself. Um, what about lawn care? Also, if you're required to do lawn care, have you been provided the tools to do so? And if you have not, or if that's expected of you and you've not been provided the tools, well, you may wanna to talk to your landlord about having some kind of rent credit and putting that also. When I'm saying talk, you can have, a, you can have that conversation face-to-face, -face, over the phone, whatever it may be. Generally speaking, I think text messaging is the worst form of communication on the planet. Um, so try to reduce it to writing, try to send an email, use full sentences because text messages can, can, can convey different meanings, but take the time, sit down, write out an email, write out a letter, make a copy of it, send it off. Boiler plate clauses. So this kind of goes to your question a little bit earlier about you know my our former landlord pa passed away so these may seem like and this is going to be if you've got that 50 page lease packet you're gonna your eyes are probably gonna glaze over as you read through line after line like i don't understand what this says i don't understand what this says so you're going to see things like an indemnification clause maybe there's mandatory mediation for some issues maybe there's an acceleration clause uh severability survivorship uh, indemnification means that your landlord's not going to be liable for certain things. So you want to pay attention for what those may be. Uh, mediation, Brent was speaking to that earlier. Some leases will have a mandatory mediation clause. If there's something, if there's a clause that indicates that, uh, and this is barred in mobile home leases, uh, but if you have, you know, all disputes will be resolved by arbitration, well, that may not be enforceable because that's arguably going to be a waiver of the court process for FEDs, which is not permitted. Uh, acceleration clause, that would be, it depends on how it is written, but what we're discussing, what I'm referring to here is, if rent is late, then the remainder of the lease amounts are due in, within 10 days. That's likely going to be an, un, an unreasonable liquidated damages clause, but again, it's something to be mindful of as you're reading through it. Uh, severability typically means that if one clause is held unenforceable, the rest of the lease remains in place. Uh, survivorship is going to be where uh, the contract is going to survive the people that signed it. All right. Um, they may seem unimportant. You may not understand them, but you should ask what they mean. And if you have an opportunity, the, the Ask a Lawyer clinics are a great place to get answers on what is this, what does this mean in this contract? All right. Um, a lot of times you don't have the opportunity to take the lease from the leasing office and go have it independently reviewed, but you should at least be reviewing every single clause and making notes on what does this paragraph mean? Because if you're signing a binding document and you don't have an understanding of what it means, you don't know what you just signed. Uh, exempt residential agreement. 
So this is a spe this is a separate type of tenancy in Colorado, and it has to be identified in the lease as such. So if you see this, if you see in your lease that you are, that this is an exempt residential agreement or that you are an exempt residential tenant, that means that one, you're renting a single family home because this is not available for apartments or condos or townhomes. It's also leased by a landlord who owns five or fewer single family rental homes. So we're not gonna be doing this with a property management company. And in the lease, it has to include with this exempt residential agreement that you don't have a right to a 10 day demand. And instead you only have a right to a five day demand. So again, keeping in mind that this has to be disclosed in the lease itself, oral leases, verbal tenancies can never be exempt residential agreements because there is no right, there is no writing. Also, if it's an oral lease or verbal tenancy, there can't be any late fees because they weren't disclosed in the lease because there is no written lease. Also rules and regulations. Um, you're going to see this in uh, mobile home parks. You're also going to likely see this in larger apartment communities as well. These are going to be additional conditions of the tenancy. These are rules, these are reasons that you can be evicted. Um, so you want to review your lease for any reference to additional rules and regulations. They may come in the form of an addendum, but again, read every line, read where any cross references are here, because you need to understand what it is that you are agreeing to when you enter into this contract. You may receive a copy with your lease. Um, I would if it is referred, if rules and regulations or some kind of community rules are referred to in the lease itself, really hammer home that you want a physical copy of that for your records, all right? Because you wanna make sure that you're upholding your end of the bargain when you sign your lease. Things you may see in them, if there's some kind of special grievance procedure, neighborly grievance procedure for, um, for tenants, if there are quiet hours in the building, uh, visitor rules. Uh, these are all things that may be included in rules or regulations, and they're things that you want to be mindful of as you enter into your tenancy. So, been skirting around this issue, but let's talk about late fees a little bit here. They have to be in the lease. If they are not disclosed in the lease, there are no late fees. They can only, late fees can only be charged once rent is seven days late. The late fee can only be five, well, that's weird. Uh, sorry about the typo. 5% uh, or $50, whichever is greater. Um, they can be charged multiple times so long as the total amount of late fees does not exceed 5% or $50. You cannot be evicted for non-payment of late fees. You cannot be charged interest for non-payment of late fees. You cannot have late fees taken out of a rental payment. If your rent is $500 a month and you're, you're late on your rent, so your landlord charges you $25 late fees, and then you pay your rent and they say, well, you still owe me $25 because I took, I, I took the late fees out of your rent payment, please contact Colorado Legal Services. You may have a claim for impermissible late fees because if you're a landlord and you're thinking, well, I've been doing this for this way forever, what's the big deal? It is a $50 penalty for every violation of the late fee statute. Uh, tenants, if you send a seven day demand letter stating that, hey, you've charged these illegal late fees, you need to fix it and it is not fixed, you can then take your landlord to court. And at that point, that $50 penalty also then can include potential penalties of $250 to $1,000 per violation of the late fee statute. Also, uh, if your landlord is trying to charge you a late fee, you have a right to a written notice by the landlord of the late fee within 180 days of the late payment. So if you're gonna charge a late fee, or if you're being charged a late fee, you have a right to notice of that late fee being charged. Early lease termination is also something that may be addressed in leases. And generally speaking, it's not permissible in too many situations. The language of the lease is oftentimes 
where you're going to find out, this is how I can break my lease, this is how I can terminate my lease early. If you terminate your lease early without any kind of agreement, then you are setting yourself up for one, the loss of your security deposit. And also, if it takes your former landlord a bit of time to re-rent the place, you may be on the hook for the rent uh, during that time as well. So uh, if your lease doesn't have explicit language about it, um, you can also terminate your lease early if there's been a breach of the warranty of habitability or a repeat breach of the warranty of habitability. There's also uh, a special provision for uh, to uh, add protections for the victims of domestic violence, stalking, and or unlawful sexual behavior. There is a specific process to go through that. Uh, and with the domestic violence protections, that also does require the payment of one month's rent. Uh, otherwise, you don't get your security deposit back. Military orders, act of God. Uh, so long as that act of God is not caused by your negligence. For example, if your house burned down, but you caused the fire, uh, you're probably gonna have bigger issues than just your early lease termination. But uh, either way, um, that is a basis to terminate a lease. So again, multiple warranty of habitability breaches. Um, so long as it's not related to appliances, uh, if the same condition of the residence renders it uninhabitable two times in a six month period, you can just terminate your lease with 14 days notice and your landlord has no ability to cure the uninhabitable condition. So rent receipts. We talked about receipts when talking about the application fees. Uh, the same applies for rent payments itself. Um, make sure that you have, when you're reading through your lease, make sure that you have a way to receive the, receive the rental receipts. Um, I've been seeing leases where the only way that rent is accepted uh, is going to be th through some portal system. So really clarify that you're going to be able to receive a receipt through the portal system, or that the landlord has some kind of system set up where they provide you with a notice or some kind of disclosure statement indicating that the rent has been paid. Uh, it's only going to apply to cash or money orders because if we kind of take that one step further, it's not going to apply to checks because when the check gets cashed, you're gonna have that you're gonna have that cash check record in your bank records. Um, if it's paid through some kind of app, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, whatever it may be, you're likely going to have those records as well. But again, even if you have these electronic records, back them up, make sure that you have a copy of them in all the transactions. That way you have the most complete record of all the payments that you've made. That way, if there's ever a dispute over, well, you know, they're, miscount they're miscounting the rent that I paid, you have the records to show what you paid. Yeah. Is the landlord um, allowed to charge for um, charge by cash app or PayPal or PayPal or whatever on top of the rent? Nope. Well, I mean, you, if you disclose it, sure, but you better disclose that um, because otherwise you're just increasing the rent without notice. And as as a landlord, if you're choosing to accept that payment in that manner, that's your choice. So um, I think you're referring to something like a convenience fee or something like that. Yeah, so PayPal charges um, a little dollars to the rent towards the bank. Oh, yeah, yeah. So in that case, is it acceptable to write it in the lease? That fee has to be covered as well by the I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but you need to be very explicit about that. Right. Um, I would also I would also advise giving another option as to how rent can be paid. Yeah, okay. Totally yeah. But no, I don't I, I don't think that there's anything in the law uh, just off first glance. I don't there's nothing in the law that prohibits that, but you've got to disclose what you're charging folks for. Right, right, right. So best practice, keep your receipts with your lease. Keep them in a folder, keep them secured, keep them in a safe location and continue to update that folder with any additional receipts or new receipts as you're paying your rent. Also with any kind of correspondence or communication you receive from your landlord, any letters, any notices, any demands. Because if you're ever sitting down with me, things probably haven't been going very well. And I'm gonna ask you, please send me every, I'm gonna ask you to send me everything, all the communications between you and your landlord. 
Um, and that's a lot easier, it makes my job a lot easier um, when the records are well kept, but it also makes your life as a tenant easier because you can go through the history of things. You can see that I was given notice on these days. You're establishing a practice where you keep records related to your tenancy. So what are some of the security deposit issues that you may, you may, that may come up as you're reviewing the lease itself? Review any move out clauses. What is the process for the move out clause? When do I have to provide notice if I'm going to be moving and it's my choice to end the tenancy? Because if it says you're required to provide a 30 day notice and you give a 10 day notice, you could be on the hook for another month of rent. Also any move out obligations that you have as a tenant, do you have to do a walkthrough? The law does not require that that occurs. My opinion is it's the best practice for both the landlord and the tenant to do a walkthrough at the beginning and at the end. That way, each side is aware of these were the issues at the beginning, these are the, they remain the issues at the end, or here are the new issues at the end. Also take pictures, back them up, take as many as you want of things that work and things that don't work. Also pay mind uh, attention to if there will be any professional cleaners hired by the landlord at your expense or at, at the move out time. Um, because then if that's going to happen regardless, uh, then you may be setting yourself up for the loss of your, for, you know, wasting money. If you go out and you rent a carpet cleaner yourself, if that's going to be done beforehand anyway, or after the fact anyway. Or are you required to hire the professional cleaners? If that's the case, then you should do your own price checking and then make sure that you get a receipt. Because if the lease says you have to hire professional cleaners and you go you go flip your buddies a cut, you go flip your buddies a 20 to come over with uh, some Windex and a uh, vacuum cleaner, you're gonna have trouble showing that you followed the lease when it comes to the security deposit accounting. Is there a walkthrough checklist, especially at the beginning of the lease? If there is a walkthrough checklist, do it, complete it, keep a, rec keep a copy for your own records. Don't wait a few months to do it. I would recommend, recommend doing that before you bring in the first boxes of things off, uh, out of the car or, out, or off the truck. Again, can't stress this enough, get a copy of the lease. So that's the law that requires the disclosure of the lease agreement. And within seven days of signing it, that's when you have the you have a right to that being returned within that seven day period. So this is going to touch on more month to month tenancies. And that's when can my landlord raise the rent? So if you have a if you have a 12 month lease and it's locked into that 12 months, not during that time period. Uh, some leases will have a provision that says, and this is why the holdover or rollover provision is so important, it will identify if there is a holdover tenancy, then the rent shall increase 10%, 20%, whatever that percentage may be. There Again, there is no cap on the amount that rent can be raised. Uh, so landlords are not able to, to increase rent more than one time in any 12-month period of consecutive occupancy by the tenant. And that's only one increase, regardless of whether there's a written agreement, the length of the tenancy, and whether the tenancy is a fixed term, month to month, or indefinite term. Oh, duplicate, sorry. And that can only be done with uh, 60 days written notice. So moving then, shifting over to mobile home park leases. These are a little bit different in some aspects, and the rationale behind that is the unique relationship between park owners and homeowners in a park, because as a homeowner in the park, you own your home, but you're renting the land underneath you. So that's a lot different than renting an apartment in, in an apartment community or complex. So in, in, if you own your home in a park, there are no oral leases. There are no verbal tenancies. It must be in writing. Um, I think it's arguable that if you are just renting a home in a park, then you can enter into an oral lease. I would really recommend against doing that. So another thing that's different in a park, and this again is why it is so crucial 
to read through every single word of your lease, every single word of any rules or regulations. And that's in a park, the termination of a tenancy that can only occur for cause. Cannot use what's called a notice to quit, stating that we're terminating your tenancy at the end of the month. It has to be for cause. There has to be a violation of the rules. Also, security deposits cannot be greater than one month rent in a mobile home park for homeowners. So what is that cause that I'm referring to? The home is not in compliance with local ordinances and state laws and regulations relating to mobile homes and home lots, not following the written rules and regulations. So again, we can see here just why it is so critical to make sure that you read everything and that you get a copy of everything. The parks condemn, the park changes use, uh, knowing false or misleading statements on a tenancy application, uh, conduct that unreasonably endangers the life of a person in the park, uh, conduct that damages or destroys the property of a person in the park in a willful, wanton, or malicious manner, or conduct that constitutes a felony offense or was the basis for an action that declared the home a class one public nuisance. That doesn't mean that you have a, an annoying neighbor. That means that the neighbor was taken to court and their property was found to be a public nuisance by a judge. So what are required to be in mobile home park leases? The term of the tenancy is required in these leases. They are typically going to be month to month uh, terms. The amount of rent due, the day that rent is due and payable, the day when rent is late. Now in non-mobile home park settings, it's you can only charge a late fee once seven days have passed since the day rent is due. In a park, if you own your home, it's 10 days. The rules and regulations are required to be included with the lease in a mobile home park for homeowners. The name and mailing address where a manager's decision can be appealed. And then all other charges to the homeowner other than rent, including any late fees. So going back to your question about the, the convenience fee on the electronic payments, um, we see that reflected in mobile home park leases. Um, so that's why I typically, that's why I think that is the best practice to include uh, and to just be transparent in, uh, in your communications to include that information of any potential fees that may be incurred by a tenant uh, during their stay, during their residency there. So if you can be evicted over rules and regulations in a park, when can they change? If you get permission for rule change, then immediately. If not, 60 days notice. And that notice has to be in writing. So what are things that cannot be included in a mobile home park lease? Cannot waive any rights given by statute. Cannot require a homeowner to agree to a possessory lien. Cannot require arbitration instead of the court process. Cannot authorize a third person to confess judgment on a claim arising from the rental agreement. Meaning that a third party can't agree on your behalf as the homeowner to some kind of claim or dispute arising from an alleged breach of the rental agreement. Uh, and anything that goes against these, that any lease agreement or any lease provision that violates these, it's again, it's void against public policy and it's going to be unenforceable. So one of the main questions is, well, how do I enforce these? What do I do? Uh, the short answer is, the long answer is, uh, I, it's gonna be too lengthy for us to discuss, gonna need to really investigate the case, review your lease, interview you, discuss it and research the law. But the shorter answers are a small claim section, injunctive relief. Uh, where you would take, um, you know, you would take your landlord to court or you would be taken to court to essentially stop doing something. Or a declaratory action where you go to court and you have a judge rule on what a contract provision means. This is why rather than go through the court process, which is going to take time and you are still going to be living with the issue, it's so important to get these issues reduced to writing in the beginning of the tenancy. And there may be other methods of enforcement, but these are just kind of the broad strokes on how can you enforce things. Small claims actions are for claims that are under $7,500. Um, you, can, you can pursue injunctive relief for the breach of warranty of habitability. 
if there is a dispute over what a lease clause means uh, or a lease paragraph means, that's where we'd be likely looking at to, uh, take, trying to file some kind of declaratory action. Uh, but again, this is not legal advice. If you think, oh, that's what I'm going to do in my case because I saw it on the slide, please talk to someone first about it because if you do it wrong, there can be very steep financial penalties for doing it wrong. Also, for mobile home for homeowners in a mobile home park, there is the Mobile Home uh, Dispute Resolution Board that's uh, managed. That is that the Department of Local Affairs uh, operates. So there is an additional. Dis there's mediation kind of built into the law for homeowners in a mobile home park. All right, and ooh, before we go, before we open up the questions. There were questions that were previously submitted, um, and I will just review those. Sorry. So um, amenities have not been available for three years so far. Uh, I don't really know what this question is asking yet. Uh, some amenities may be covered by the warranty of habitability. Some may be outside. Uh, would recommend reviewing your lease to see if these amenities are included in the lease, because if let's say you, uh, it's a laundry room that's included in the lease that you have access to and you're being deprived of that, then you may want to request a rent credit because if that's included in your lease, then you are paying for that amenity. Uh, are rules regarding smoking legal? Yes. Uh, marijuana is legal for recreational and medicinal purposes but there still may be prohibitions in at least against using marijuana in the home or apartment. But yeah, rules against smoking are fine. Can I break my lease without penalty? Probably not. Uh, we're gonna need to review the lease first, but more than likely you can't do that. There needs to be a basis to do so. And likely that is going to require some kind of penalty. Um, I am a section eight renter in a low income housing tax credit assistance housing. I have not got a lease renewal which ran out on May 31st. For low-income housing tax credit properties, those are one of the tenancies which require cause to terminate the lease. So if you're complying with your lease, then there's no basis to terminate the lease and your lease will continue on unless your landlord has cause to terminate it. But for a low-income housing tax credit property, that does require some kind of cause to terminate a tenancy. I haven't had a lease since 2013 and my landlord hasn't raised rent. My kind landlord hasn't raised rent. What should I expect other than he'll sell, sell my home? Um, it's a broad question. If landlord wants to raise the rent, 60 days written notice. Uh, if your landlord is selling the home and you are concerned about being evicted by the new owners. Um, broad strokes here is you can record your lease with the clerk and recorder. That puts any potential buyers on notice of the tenancy uh, and it protects your tenancy. So if you sign a 12 month lease and the house is sold one month into the 12 month lease, you're probably gonna wanna record that, record your lease before the sale because that will protect and preserve your tenancy for the remainder of the lease agreement. Um, if you don't, then the new owners can give you a three-day notice uh, to quit. I need to know if my lease is legal. Uh, I would recommend applying for services. Um, if a landlord returns the tenant's security deposit over a year after having moved out, are there legal consequences for the landlord? Uh, there can be, but it's gonna depend on, the, depend on some more facts. Uh, as a tenant, you have to provide your landlord with, sorry, landlords are only required to send the security deposit, refund, or the accounting statement to the last known address. So as a tenant, if you want to ever receive that, you're going to have to provide a good address because chances are the last known address that your landlord has on file for you is the residence you just moved out of. And they can send it to the apartment that you just moved out of. If you've never said, hey, this is where you can send my security deposit, they have no obligation to track you down and find you. Um, do they keep that money then? Do they keep the landlord that money if they can't track you down? Or they turn it over to um, 
unclaimed money and stuff like that? That's a great question. I have no idea what the answer is. Um, I would recommend not spending it. Um, I kind of, I just found some money on unclaimed money and have nothing to do with any of the secure deposits I didn't get back from former landlords. Yeah, it's... So they keep it. I would assume that they would, I mean, at a certain point, that mail is going to get returned undeliverable. So they don't have an obligation to come find you. So I don't, I think that money just kind of sits in the, sits in the account. Um, yeah. Um, they don't have an obligation to come find you. They have an obligation to come to pay those people who rent in general, or stuff more on the street. Um, and so they have to pay those people. Mailbox rule. Uh, so, um, Sorry. Uh, uh, what the mailbox rule is, is let's say you authorize the rent to be mailed in, right? And then tenant says, hey, I mailed it to you, but it got lost in the mail. I don't know what you want me to do. Well, you can't charge late fees because you're the one that said it's okay if you mail it to me. Um, I don't think that really answers your question, but if, if there's not an obligation for the landlord to come and pick up the rent every month, but it, yeah, this is also why it's very important to include these details in the lease itself on, you know, how is rent to be paid, right? It's to be paid by putting it in the drop box, by, you know, mailing it, by delivering it in person. But if you authorize delivery in person, you better be available to your tenants on the day rent is due. Right. All right. So I've gathered that. And so I get a tenant to pay out rent for Okay, I'm on my way to pay. Well, I'm not going to be at home. I'll be there later. Okay, except for I'm not going to run around town chasing you down for what you owe me. Right, right. So, what I was wondering is, like, how do I approach that? Because I'm getting tired of, well, I'm not going to pay up this time, blah, blah, blah. And then when they are available, are you present? Are you present? Are you present? Like, yo, I fill that time with something else to take care of my, my personal um, daily things, and I'm tired of. Well, I can't do this if I got this too. Yeah, well, I work five jobs. So I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how to approach that. Maybe approach it with a an addendum on how to pay rent, setting a time that you'll be available to pick it up on a certain day. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, multiple bugs and spiders, but landlords refusing to spray more than once a month. I'm immunocompromised. Can I get more sprays? This is a bit too fact specific for me to get into really a detailed analysis here. Uh, but generally speaking, um, this may be a situation where you want to submit a reasonable a request for reasonable accommodation. Uh, reasonable accommodation is to protect um, is to protect the rights of, of those who are disabled uh, and also to ensure that they that everybody is able to have the full use and enjoyment of the of their residence. Um, so if you find yourself in that situation, would recommend a uh, reasonable accommodation request. Is there a dollar limit set to how much a landlord can raise a person's rent a year? No. Uh, they can ra raise it once per 12 months of occupancy, but there is no limitation on how much it can be raised. Um, yeah. I have a question on that. Somewhere I wrote down, they can, oh, so 12 months of occupancy. See, if you're consecutive lease, occupancy, consecutive occupancy. Right, if you're in a signed lease, but if you're on a month-to-month -month lease, they can charge you. Nope. No. Just Doesn't matter. The months. term of the tenancy does not matter for the purposes of a rent increase. If you're month-to-month -month and you've been there for nine years, um, they can still only raise it once every twelve months, and they can still only do that with sixty days written notice, and they cannot give you a notice to quit to try to bypass that sixty-day requirement. I just misunderstood. I thought it was per term, per lease term. No, 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 no. Per 12 months of continued, continue, eh, consecutive occupancy. Landlords denying us mail, safe enter and entry, and protection from personal property breaking. Uh, there's a lot going on in this question. Uh, you can't be denied mail service. If that's occurring, you may want to contact the Postal Service. They have their investigators for the matter. Safe entry may be subject to the warranty of habitability, uh, and personal property may not be protected. Um, would recommend applying for further assistance because there's just too much factual background here for me to really get into this question too much. 
Um, landlord is attempting to sell the townhome, showings, inspections. Lease is not up until the end of February. This is where you'd want to record your lease with the clerk and with the clerk and recorder, uh, because that will put any potential buyers on notice that hey, there's a tenant here until the end of February. If you don't do that, you don't protect your tenancy. Uh, what should I do if my landlord repeatedly violates the warranty of habitability and then threatens eviction? Retaliation for making a good faith complaint of the warranty of habitability to include threatening eviction is now permissible by law, but this is going to be a little bit too fact specific for me to get into anything more than that. Uh, would recommend applying for services with CLS. Um, and that was the last pre question that we had. Let me go to the chat. Oh, I was going to say I have two. It's okay. Hard. The chat's a mess, so let me do it. All right, right. sounds good. Um, so the first one is I began a lease starting on Monday upon entering the property. The house was filthy, hair, dirt, dead bugs, urine on the toilet seat. House was a wreck. The property manager has not been any help, and I have given written notice of these issues. Is this filth around the house a violation of warranty of habitability, in your opinion? And also, should I be able to get out of the lease contract and go somewhere else because of this? So, like I said at the at the outset of the presentation, I'm unable to provide legal advice um, given the situation that you are describing. Um, you may want to apply for potential advice or further services with CLS. I, generally speaking. Um, Cleanliness is not a violation of the warranty of habitability. The warranty of habitability does apply to common areas under the landlord's control, but even if a common area is very, like, you know, an apartment lobby or something uh, is very messy or dirty, so long as you're able to use your residence, that's likely not going to be a violation of, or a breach of the warranty of habitability. So the next one is, um, do the restrictions on rent increases apply to hotels slash motels that function as long-term rentals? It's a really good question. Um, so the question was for anybody who didn't hear, does the limit on rent increases apply to hotels, motels for long-term rentals? Uh, it depends because some municipalities have restrictions and limitations on hotel and long-term long-term hotel tenancies. So it is, I'm not comfortable kind of giving a snap answer on that question, just because it's going to vary uh, depending on where you live. Okay. And then the next one is describe the rights of leaseholder versus occupant. This also included law regarding standing in a residence and the rights of persons with standing versus a leaseholder. Leaseholder is the, the leaseholder is the person that signed it. The occupants are the people that live there. Um, if the occupants are authorized, they would. It's a very broad question, but generally speaking, if they are an authorized occupant, meaning they're on the lease, they're allowed to be there. Uh, they would have the same rights as a leaseholder. The leaseholder is the person who signs the lease. It's who the contract is entered in between. If you are an unauthorized occupant, then you can be the basis for everybody to be evicted. That's it in the chat for now. All right. So that's it in the chat for now. Um, does anybody in the audience here have any more questions? And folks also online, uh, please keep hammering away at questions as well, and we'll get to those. I'm gonna go left to right. Um, in, in my lease, it talks about the animals that are allowed in the apartment complex, um, but the complex does not go by their own rules. It depends. <laughs> um, and here's one of the tricky things as we're talking about, when we're talking about animals and we, we make the conclusion of they're not following their own rules. We don't know if those other persons uh, have, if, served, if they've filled out a reasonable accommodation, if it is an emotional support animal um, that has been granted. If it's an emotional support animal, it would not kill another dog. All right, now we're getting too fact specific. Um, 
because again, I don't, the answer is I don't know. Well, um, the last two years ago, I looked into it. There are no pet and apartment complex laws Correct. in this city or this state. So, there are breed restrictions in certain cities, but generally speaking, yeah, that's um, not in this one, but um, it's uh, a little too fact specific for me to just answer it on the fly because again, I take these matters serious. I take these matters serious. And if you're dealing with something that's affecting your ability to enjoy your residence, to enjoy the home that you're putting work into, to make that, to make that apartment a home, to make that house a home, I don't wanna just snap off the first thing that comes into my mind. I wanna be able to read through the lease itself. Um, so please feel free to apply for CLS services. Well, it's too late now, but... But in the future, you have our contact information. How about if the person... Well, hold on, I'll come back to you. Hold on. One, one question at a time. I have a question. Can we meet with you after this to show you our lease that we have? and to find out she asks us to send her a list of things that need to be fixed and whatnot and it takes her almost 10 years to do that. Uh, apply for services come in in person and apply okay. okay um and then make sure to bring your lease with you because that's just uh you know i have certain restrictions on my employment and one of those is that i'm only able to assist my clients so that's also why I'm saying can't okay. can't provide legal advice, can only provide information. I'm not trying to be rude by any means. Oh, yeah, um, but um, please take our comp take our contact information. There are some brochures in the back table. And um, you know, please bring your lease in for us to review it and give you some maybe some advice on the matter. Yes. Where is the presentation saved? Where is the presentation saved online? Did you, did, sorry. Where is the presentation Where? saved online? Uh, it is on the city's website at community development forward slash renter 6101. We will also send uh, out the, that link as well as the links to all the resources for anyone who registered. If you didn't register and you would like to receive those, do sign up uh, on the sign up sheet uh, before you leave. And you'll sign up. All right, going back left to right, coming back to you. Uh, so um, the person who had the question about leaseholder versus occupant, she has a follow-up question. She says she'll speak. So I'm going to see if we can. Sure. So. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So I'm a leaseholder and um, an occupant in my home um, decided to move out. However, she's continuing to um, claim standing um, and um, access to the home. So how long do I continue to allow access to the home as the leaseholder? So this is gonna be one of those questions that I would need a lot more information. Um, the question was uh, regarding, and the question was from the leaseholder and there was an occupant who has moved out but is still claiming that they have standing in the home. Um, that's going to be a lot more fact specific uh, and it's going to be legal advice for me to answer that one. So I would I would recommend that you apply for CLS services. Uh, so hopefully we can address that question because one of the first things I'm going to want to do is review your lease itself. She's uh, been removed. Um, she's so been removed from the. She's she's um, been removed from services either over the phone uh, at 719-471-0380 extension 444, online at coloradolegalservices.org or in person at 617 South Nevada Avenue. Right, and she's been removed from the lease. So does she still have standing? Make an application. Okay. This lady, even though her dog killed my dog, she continues to harass me. Okay, yeah, come. So I'll just come. Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm gonna, I, I don't, I'm by no means trying to punt on your questions, no, but I, I would just, we would need to have a much more in-depth conversation than the, confines of attorney client confidentiality. Yeah, well, I'm going to go home and read my read the lease because the management at the apartment complex has given this lady like three strikes and then she's out. Well, she's had 10 times more than three strikes and management does not want to keep her out. She threatens the older people in the apartment complex. 
And one of the reasons, also one of the reasons I can't answer questions is that we'd also have to run a conflict check to make sure that the person you're not talking about is not somebody that we've assisted in the past. Yeah, I understand. I just, I just want to be clear that I'm not just avoiding your questions. No, I understand. Uh, coming back. Um, excuse me, security here. We are closed in about 14 minutes at eight o'clock. Just want to let you know. Uh, in the back, red shirt. Oh, okay. Luis does not have a place in Who can see you can give him the temperature and a room room. Okay. So if the lease doesn't specify the limitations on visitors, then you're going to be looking more towards kind of indicia of occupancy, meaning does this person receive mail there? Do they have a lot of personal property there? Um, if the person, if you're being accused of that, oftentimes what I will do in a case is have the other person provide their lease to show, no, this is my lease. This is where I live. Um, also, generally speaking, I advise folks not to have people send their mail to their address because it can give off the wrong impression. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, all right. If, if you have follow-up questions, again, we may need to, that may need to be a more private conversation then because it, it'll be a little bit more kind of specific to your situation and what, you're, what you've been going through. Um, but what are the, so as security let us know, we've only got a few more minutes left here, folks. Um, any, other, any other questions from the in-person crowd or online? All right, I'm seeing a lot of head shakes now and I'm getting the no more online questions. So uh, again, thank you all so much for taking time out of your week to come out tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. And again, my name is Clinton Albert. I'm with Colorado Legal Services and you can grab one of our brochures uh, back there on the table. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Clinton. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Clinton. We really appreciate um, all of that information. And um, I just wanted to also remind you, in addition to applying for services with Colorado Legal Services, remember to check out the Justice Centers, call a lawyer, ask a lawyer, the clinics, those are also places. Um, and of course, the legal um, resources at Pikes Peak Library District is also a place to find out some information about some of the issues that you may have. Um, and also, we I, I'll ask you in advance, uh, we're going to be sending out a survey to get your feedback on on what was good about this, what ideas you have to um, make them better. Um, please do fill that out when you receive it. And um, our next one of these that will not be just focused on lease, but all of the issues, um, a broader coverage of uh, renter and um, tenant landlord issues, uh, that's going to be held on November 16th at Ruth Holly Library. And we will also be sending that out to you as well. So um, I think that's it. And thank you again for being here, for attending, and to all of the partner agencies. Have a great evening.